Hi, um, my name is Wayne Modest. I think many of you know me already, so I'm going to go into a big conversation about that. I want to welcome you um, here to the Chok Museum. And at the Chok Museum, to the Research Center for Material Culture. But as many of you have already been part of the Research Center's program, and therefore are, are part of our network and understand what we're trying to do. And for those of you who don't know what it is, um, just two seconds, in 2014, when the three ethnographic museums um, here, the Folk Museum, Museum Folk Pilda, and the Africa Museum merged, um, at that time we created our research institute, uh, Research Center for Material Culture, that was based in um, the idea that ethnographic museums have been contending with questions about what to do with their histories, how to deal with their representational practices, and how do you address these kinds of collections that emerged um, in tandem with closely related to, and as a result of a colonial project, large European colonial project, but also in relationship to anthropology. We had at the time almost 400,000 objects and a million photographs. Photographs that were embedded in a particular history of photographic practices, but also were implicated in other in forms of um, colonial violence that is sometimes not spoken. For example, the project of physical anthropology and what that meant, or we represent through that. So our, our intention at the time for forming this research center was whether or not we should engage in a deep and ongoing conversation about the past, present, and future of those collections, and what those collections can help us, how they can help better help us to understand the present. That we have been involved in questioning a genealogy of photographic practice that doesn't start necessarily only, as I say all the time, in 1839 when photography was announced in Paris or London, but rather to try and account for a photo history that starts in Jamaica in 1842, or in Suriname in 1845, or in Haiti just before that. What might it mean to trace another genealogy of a photographic project that doesn't always have Europe at its center? But also, what does it mean that within the collections that we have in the museum, which are drawn from across the world, how might we understand other modalities for thinking about how we live and be in the world today? That our understanding even of the concept of the Anthropocene is very much of great um, based in a Western way of knowing and thinking, but rather that we might be able to think, take up some of the work that is being done by the decolonial um, thinkers, but also indigenous scholars which ties the beginning or that major moment of 1494 to the beginning of thinking the Anthropocene otherwise. So what we do is that we put the collection at work in that. And a part of that is just simply to continue to critically reflect on our self as an institution and what it means that we are so, we emerged in tandem with and in many ways continued some of the structures of colonialism. This lecture today, we've invited a scholar who has also been thinking through what and how to think new world slavery otherwise. And that ties to an exhibition that many of you already saw inside the museum, which is just 200 square meters of provocation for a project that we will do in 2021. In 2021, the entire floor that you're standing on now will be reorganized and will be a rethinking of how do we deal with colonialism? What is its afterlife in the present? How do you tell that story otherwise? So this afternoon, you will have um, David Scott, who we've invited for what we call a series of conversation. On Tuesday, we had a lovely conversation with David and two other scholars who are here now, Francis Baddow and Shruti Bala that's our 5 and 20, where we engage in a conversation around the work of Stuart Hall, but also a conversation of what, 
how might we develop friendships, think solidarity otherwise, as we try to address some of the most trenchant issues that animate, ensnare us in the present. David Scott is Ruth and William Lubrick Professor of Anthropology and Chair of the Department of Anthropology at Columbia University, New York. He's the editor of a wonderful journal, if you haven't started looking at it yet, it's called Small Acts, Journal of Criticism, a Caribbean Journal of Criticism. And, and director of the Small Acts Project. David has been invested for some time now in thinking with and through the Caribbean. Um, one of my favorite books of his was, um, this is where I started with his work, was Refashioning Futures, to try and understand what he has outlined, what he calls the problem space, to interrogate how we think about the post-colonial present and its relationship to how we understand questions of anti-colonialism, colonialism, and what it might mean to think those two things together. Today, he will speak to you a little bit about a, a new project that he's starting on, which we hope to have a, 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 a group of talks about. New World Slavery as Irreparable Evil. I will not go into much more of what he will say, but I'll come back after to start the discussion with some provocations, but more so to invite you to provoke him, because I think that he wants this as well, as he tries to, to work through this project. And as I said, this forms part of our ongoing work to just understand not, how, not only how slavery and colonialism continue to ensnare us in the present, but as cultural institution, how might we narrate that, represent that, articulate with what is happening in the world. So please help us welcome David Scott. Um, yes. Thank you very, very much, Wayne, for that um, introduction. And thank you very much for your uh, introductory remarks to the project of the, um, of the research center. And thank you all for coming, um, for coming out this afternoon to to engage in, a, in, a, in what I hope will be a, a conversation. Uh, as Wayne said, this is a, a sort of very preliminary um, um, piece of work. Uh, it, it grows out of work that I've been doing for a number of years, and it's really a kind of thinking out loud. And what I will read, um, this afternoon is a, is, a, is a part of a larger document which is which is uh, partially outlined and still a work in progress. So I, it's, it's an it's an invitation to to you to um, you know to help think these things through. The title is Irreparable Evil: uh, Slavery in Moral History. These are notes, as I say, they are provisional and wholly exploratory. They are intended more to try to map a conceptual terrain than to offer anything like a substantial inquiry. My overall question is the following. What is the story of New World slavery that ought to command our critical attention in the present conjuncture, and why? I believe this is a question with wide implications for how we think the predicament of black life today, the acute sense of impasse, the sense that the pasts of slavery are not behind us, but remain before us. In an admittedly preliminary way, I am going to suggest that in the current conjuncture, the story of New World slavery ought to be oriented, or rather reoriented, in the direction of a moral and more specifically a reparatory history. 
This is because the institution of New World slavery was, whatever else it was, an historical atrocity, a moral evil, perpetrated over generations on the humanity of Africans and peoples of African descent in the New World. And as such demands, whatever else it demands, a moral and reparatory response. My agenda has a number of components, but the overall direction of my itinerary will be a speculation that some past moral evils are unpardonable, and thus irreconcilable and untranscendable. They are, in effect, irreparable. To my mind, New World slavery is one of these irreparable evils. Now notice that my opening question and my provisional answer imply a certain historicity to the very problem of histories of New World slavery. They imply that there can be no single story form that is always and forever the only or the best story form for capturing the point in the present of reconstructing the past of New World slavery. The historiography of New World slavery can be written as a history of the varied story forms in relation to which the slave past has been made relevant to varied historical presence. In particular, the presence of the lives of New World peoples of African descent. And by extension, as a critical gesture, one should ask in any conjuncture or problem space what the point is of the story one is seeking to tell about the slave past in the post-slave present. What the question is that the conceptual intervention is aiming to answer. My suggestion here of a reorientation of the story of New World slavery in the direction of a moral and reparatory history is motivated by this approach to pasts in the present and by the intuition that an old domain of questions about the past in the present of New World slavery is no longer as compelling as it once was. As we well know, one very powerful story form in relation to which the past in the present of New World slavery is narrated is that of emancipationism and vindicationism. For a very long time and for wholly intelligible reasons, we have willfully and poetically constructed our stories of the relation between our slave pasts, our unfree and unjust presents, and our possible emancipated futures as a great progressive story of revolutionary redemption. The varied forms of this heroic narrative are as familiar in the African Americas of the continental United States as of the archipelagic Caribbean and no doubt in Europe as well. In this narrative, we've mobilized the picture of the slave past, of the wanton brutalities of the Middle Passage, the cruel indignities of the auction block, the inconsolable loss of family and kin, the irretrievable rupture of cultural memory and the coercive resocialization as racial subjects, the unspeakable violations to body and mind and spirits of plantation life in order to feed and nourish our will to cultural coherence and political self-determination in short. In order to vindicate our transgressed humanity, we cultivated a radical tradition of longing for the promise of social and spiritual salvation from Rastafari to black Marxism. I believe though, and have been saying so for a while, interminably perhaps, that we live today across the black diaspora in the middle of the unraveling of the self-evident purchase of this political narrative of black liberation. The connected histories of slave emancipation and post-slavery black liberation have been an exemplary instance of the construction of modernist futurities. In my view, the conceptual account 
of the story form of black emancipationism has not only diminished in compelling force, but has become more or less incoherent in as much as the anticipated features that organized its salience have collapsed or evaporated or anyway vanished. It is no longer clear how to reimagine the horizon of black freedom, let alone how to activate the social and political momentum by which we translate the past into a new future. In a certain sense, we are suffering from what some philosophers have called a loss of concepts, that is, a sort of liminal state in which all the concepts no longer adequately describe or help us criticize our world, and new ones have yet to emerge to take their place. This experience of the loss, specifically of the loss of black and socialist revolutions, was precisely what inspired my exploration in Conscripts of Modernity, a book I published in 2004 or something like that, of C.L.R. James's great history of the Haitian Revolution, the Black Jacobins. In many respects, and those of you who know the Black Jacobins will know this, in many respects, the Black Jacobins is a paradigmatic instance of the revolutionary emancipationist and vindicationist narrative. The Black Jacobins is not only a history, but a revolutionary history of the only successful slave revolution in the New World. I won't need to repeat in detail here James's memorable account of the rise and fall of his beloved hero, Toussaint Louverture. But part of what made it so compelling was the way in which its story of the misery and vicious cruelty of the slave past was anchored to a liberationist expectation of a black, anti-colonial, and socialist future. However, emancipationist narratives like James's only make sense when they are harnessed to such a progressive rhythm of social change and a horizon of futurity in which the suffering of the past, or the past as suffering, is redeemed and overcome in the making of the new day. One would be hard pressed, I believe, to argue that this remains the case today. And yet, the seminal genius of the Black Jacobins is that in the new conjunctures in which he sought to rethink and revise his great narrative, James embodied it in a speculative intuition that there may, that there may well be something not entirely adequate about the terms of his vindicationist theorizing. This is the conceptual space in which he mobilized the idea of the tragic. And while I did not know to say so in Conscripts of Modernity, I would say so now, that the idea of the tragic belongs precisely to the lexicon and idiom of a moral and preparatory history. The next section is called Moral History. I'm using moral history here in a perhaps restricted sense as the covering name for an interpretive historiographical orientation that centers our attention on the moral dimension of past and present action, in particular human action involved in causing or perpetuating social affliction and social suffering. I am, of course, especially concerned with those human actions involved in the perpetration of past acts of large-scale atrocity that produce lasting moral psychological harms. For me, moral history is in large part a history of the present of what might be called past orders of evil, past forms of wrongdoing that involve the deliberate and systematic, not accidental or contingent, violation of dimensions of our common humanity. What, though, is the problem space of moral history? And you will see that this is a question that preoccupies me around every single subject. What, though, is the problem space of moral history? What is the question 
to which moral history purports to offer an answer. One admittedly shorthand way of trying to characterize the problem space of moral history, using the temporal language I used earlier, is to say that the great modern age of universal revolutions of black or national or women's liberations, and even alas, of good old fashioned progressive social democracy, has been effectively displaced by a new age, namely an age of global humanitarianism and human rights. In a fundamental sense, humanitarianism and human rights have emerged in the post-Cold War, post War era as a new zeitgeist, a new self-image for our age, a last utopia. I do not mean to imply that this is a false or false conscious image, though it is certainly an ideological one. I do mean to imply, however, that this new social imaginary and rationality is not only pervasive in extent, it is also generative in as much as it constitutes the new normative background and the new normative horizon in relation to which we are obliged to problematize our dissatisfactions with our world, what we consider wrong with it, and what we might do to address these dissatisfactions in order to change our world for the better. Now, true, there is much that might be doubtful about the discourse and practice of international humanitarianism and human rights about, say, its inseparable entanglement with liberal individualism and neoliberal globalization, with new doctrines about the responsibility to intervene in the name of protection, with US imperial power, with continued Western cultural hegemony, and so on and on. But there may well be as much about what this age illuminates as what it leaves out, or ignores, or flattens, that is critically worth attending to at least on the genealogical principle that we are where we are, and however we got here, within the discursive field of this conjuncture, we shall have to find our way from here. One pronounced effect of the displacement of an older age of universal emancipations by our new age of universal human rights has been what we could call a reproblematization of the temporal relationship between past present and future, and a redescription of what it is about the past that bears consideration, that needs changing in the present. Certainly one dimension of temporal reorientation is what I have called the re-enchantment of the past relative to the present. Where previously, in our lost age of universal emancipations, the future was an enchanted time, a dream time of endless possibility. Now the past has come to seem an almost occult time, an enigma whose very impenetrability has itself become an obsessive object of fascination. Where once the past was a time to be overcome in the promise of a redemptive future, now with the fading or betrayal of that promise and the pervasive sense of the foreclosure of overcoming, the past has gained in complexity, density, and allure. So similarly, there has been a redescription of what is wrong with the past that calls out for change. Where the past was once conceived as a structure of social and economic exploitations and subjugations and oppressions to be overcome, or more militantly, overthrown, now the past has been effectively reconceived as a time of injuries produced by historical wrongdoing or historical injustices that demand redress. It's the space in which trauma has emerged as the problem about the past and the present. Notably, the model and idiom here are juridical and moral psychological than social economic political. The aim is to repair the past, not transform it. As a time of suffering, what is called for in respect of the past is reasoned compassion, not revolutionary rage. This is the problem space of moral history.
reparatory history. The form of moral history that especially concerns me here is reparatory history. To me, reparatory history is that dimension of moral history concerned with past evils, like New World slavery, that remain unrepaired in the present. A reparatory history is a history of the present of such pasts constructed in such a way as to illuminate what the present owes to the past. It will be apparent that I share the view held by many theories, theorists of reparatory justice that past injustice triggers obligations to make amends, to right the past wrong. And I agree too with those who hold that it is an elementary principle of reparatory justice that historical wrongs ad admit of no statute of limitations. They do not fade over the passage of time. They cannot be superseded by new circumstances. Unrepaired wrong remains wrong still. More than this, they do not only remain the wrongs they originally were when they were committed, but the claims that derive from them in both moral and material senses ramify in virtue of the fact that they have gone unrepaired. The non-repair of a wrong is itself a wrong and perpetuates and exacerbates the existing wrong. Where I part ways with liberal reparatory thinking is in its forward-looking or reconciliatory approach to the harms of past wrong. I do not share the view that reconciliation should take priority over all other considerations. There may be wrongs in respect of the commission of which it would be a further wrong to reconcile oneself. Such wrongs are irreparable. Reparatory histories register the generative trace of past injustice that is not, in fact, past. It registers the trace of past injustice that haunts the present. I use this knowledge of used term advisedly. I do not mean to suggest that there are some histories for which the past is safely and securely in the past, over and done with, without a trace in the present. Pasts whose historical actors have, so to speak, finally arrived, Hegelian fashion, at their teleological destinations their rendezvous at the end of time. I mean rather to evoke the idea of pasts that are unresolved or unreconciled in the present. And here again I'm referring not merely to histories shaped, as all histories in some sense presumably are, by social conflict and political struggle, but histories pervasively, perhaps permanently, unsettled by a troubled past that lingers, that lives on in an encumbering and burdensome way in the present. I mean pasts that weigh like dead generations of the unappeased and unresigned past on the collective psyche of the living. It will be evident then that for me the special value of the idea of haunting pasts, and here I depart in some measure from Avery Gordon's more capacious, more wide-ranging use, is that it helps to attune us to the poignant, sometimes intangible senses in which an appalling or unspeakable or indescribable wrong has been committed in the past and has left in its wake a wound that will not heal, and in support of an injury to spirit as much as body that continues to rankle with indignation, with humiliated resentment, and that incoherently perhaps afflicts and torments the present. I mean all of those metaphors in very precise ways. Further and perhaps crucially, reparatory history points not only to pasts that have not been resolved or reconciled, but pasts that are disavowed by those who either per perpetrated the historical wrong or who are beneficiaries of that wrong. These disavowed pasts then are pasts for which 
no responsibility is accepted, in which innocence is claimed, and for which, therefore, there has been no reckoning. In short, preparatory history points not just an oppressive past, but an unrepaired and disavowed past, a past of wrongful injurious actions that have not been duly or adequately acknowledged, much less addressed as the wrongful injurious actions they were. The history of New World slavery, I believe, presents us with one such unresolved and unrepaired past, whose disturbed and disconsolate afterlives constitute our racial present. As I suggested earlier, it is important to stress that from my perspective, our reparatory history does not presuppose that all historical wrongs are such as can be repaired. In this sense, reparatory history is expressly not a progressivist history. Indeed, part of the significance for me of a moral and reparatory history is precisely, as I suggested earlier, that it emerges in the context of the exhaustion of progressivist history to point a future beyond the present. Reparatory history does not presuppose moral improvement. It is not compensatory. It need offer no balm of restitution. It does not aim to constitute for itself a rhythm of futurity that redeems the past. To the contrary, what a reparatory history tries to, tries to do is to attune itself and to attune us to the, to the discomforting fact that some loss or damage or injury or failure can be permanent, irreparable, in the sense meant by George Steiner when he observed acutely that Oedipus didn't get his eyes back. Not all histories can have happy endings. In my view, it is these kinds of wrongs, those that are irreparable, that evil seeks to describe. To my mind, therefore, the sensibility of a moral and preparatory history is both catastrophic and tragic. It is catastrophic in the sense that it seeks to take the measure of the, fi of the features of a founding social rupture and devastation. It is tragic in as much as it aims to be responsive to the fact that once set in motion, some historical human actions are, quite simply, irreversible, the consequences unstoppable. This is the case with the story of New World slavery. Its history is at once catastrophic and tragic. In my view, as I will argue in more detail later, New World slavery is one such irreparable injustice, one such irreparable wrong. The harms of New World slavery are of the dimensions of the incalculable. That is to say, they do not amount to, the, to a discrete assortment of bad things, stolen property, and so forth for which compensation or restitution can be rationally calculated. Nor are these harms, strictly speaking, imaginable. Even fictive representation, whether in film or, pr or prose literature, fails to summon up for us a pervasive picture of the life of the enslaved. Evil. I have said that a moral and reparatory history is a history of evil. What do I mean to do with this admittedly quasi-theological term? What does it mean? In part, I don't know. Undoubtedly, the question of evil has in recent years emerged as a serious topic of theorization marked by the publication of a number of provocative philosophic texts. And texts. I'm thinking of books as varied as John Keeks's Facing Evil, Susan Nyman's Evil in Modern Thought, Peter Dews's The Idea of Evil, Claudia Card's The Atrocity Paradigm, Adio Fears, The Order of Evil, Richard Bernstein's Radical Evil, and Simone Forti's New Demons. To be sure, these and other recent books on the topic do not add up to a concerted vision, but they do, I think, point in the direction of a broad conjuncture of preoccupations. I am in fact less concerned, as you will undoubtedly already um, 
recognize, to try to sort out what their various approaches, to sort out their various approaches, than to endeavor to describe the wider conceptual problem space they seem to share, the general question that appears to animate the idea of evil with, with a new and quickened intellectual relevance. To begin with, I have already pointed to the exhaustion of the great modernist narratives of social and economic and political pro progress, principally, obviously, Marxism and liberalism, those world historical 19th and 20th century political antagonists. Whatever their considerable ideological differences, what these rival enlightenment accounts had in common was, of course, their optimistic self-confidence in the powers of reason. The evident exhaustion of these narratives of rational progress has left us with a less transparent world, with a less readily comprehensible world. In a profound sense, our confidence in our human capacity to understand, much less fix our world, has more or less vanished. What to do with Trump is a very minor instance. I do not, of course, suggest that any of the authors I have noted above argue in precisely this way. But my own view is that with this conceptual darkening of our life world, a kind of void has opened, a generalized and barely nameable precarity that has brought into sharp relief the human capacity for, pervas for perversion and cruelty, and that throws into question all our assumptions about judgment, responsibility, culpability, compassion, indeed about human life itself. And it is in this void, I believe, that a post-secular idea of evil has acquired dense and critical force as a way at least of evoking an entrenched, perhaps ineradicable opacity and unintelligibility of the human experience of violation and suffering. Needless to say, in the portentous archive of the new literature on evil, it is the Holocaust that is the pa paradigmatic instance of historical moral wrong. The Holocaust stands apart as a unique and unparalleled event, an order of evil that not only supersedes, but conceptually frames the intelligibility of all other evils. It is a meta-evil. Whatever it was in its own facticity and historicity, the Holocaust is no longer just the proper name for an empirical event. It is an order of truth. Truth by virtue of exception. By contrast, New World, slave, New World Slavery scarcely appears in the growing archive of evil. It has no real presence in any of the books I've mentioned. And when it does appear, can scarcely sustain that appearance. Or rather, it typically appears, when it does appear, merely en passant, duly acknowledged, but only as an item on the list of other empirical evils. In consequence, New World slavery has no theoretical value as such, as an order of truth about evil. It doesn't rise to the status of universality. On the contrary, it, mean, it remains a mere historical and therefore contingent instance of a larger class of, repre of reprehensible moral actions. How conceptually are we to understand this? I'm not entirely sure. It isn't simply that the Holocaust was the more recent of the catastrophes, that slavery happened, as people like to say, long ago. Although, to be sure, there is certainly the conceit that the 20th century was, somehow, the most terrible century ever. Undoubtedly, in many ways, it is the figure and work of Hannah Arendt that has given a certain impetus and direction to the, con 
temporary considerations of evil and to the prevailing place of exception of the Holocaust in these considerations. The two crucial texts, of course, are the origins of totalitarianism and Eichmann in Jerusalem. The contrasts between them have been plentifully discussed. And for my purposes here, I need not do more than sketch the different formulations they embody, at least enough to set off the distinctiveness of New World, sa of New World slavery as itself an order of evil. Toward the end of the preface to the first edition of the Origins of Totalitarianism, Arendt writes with reference to what can be learned from the totalitarian experience, and I quote, and if it is true that in the final stages of the Nazi regime, an absolute evil appears, absolute because it can no longer be deduced from humanly comprehensible motives, it is also true that without it, we might never have known the truly radical nature of evil. Evil there with an, with an uppercase E. Hmm? What the contrast and connection here is, is not specified between an absolute evil with a lowercase e and the radical nature of an evil with an uppercase e. What the contrast and connection here are is not specified, but an absolute evil, she suggests, <coughs> is one that cannot be made intelligible in relation to any conventional account of human interests, those comprehensible motives. Later in the book, of course, Arendt will develop this idea, crucial to her and notable to me, that part of what is distinctive about the horror of Nazi totalitarianism, and, and in particular, of the death camps <coughs> that for her defined its essence, is that the extermination of the Jews served no rational purpose beyond the practice of sheer terror. It is partly this, the senselessness of mass murder, that places that experience of death outside of any conceivable rational discourse and marks it for her as evil. And it is this that frames the death camps as a limit experience, not merely as an extremity of what is normal, but as an exception to normality. Not only was this evil absolute in the sense of being complete and utter and unqualified, but without its appearance in the historical world, we would have no worldly human knowledge of the radical nature of that transcendental order, namely evil, with an uppercase E. In a passage worth quoting at length, because of the way in which the death camps as exception are rhetorically constructed so as to foreclose rather than invite a meaningful comparison with any other form of atrocity, are at rights, and I'm quoting. There are no parallels to the, to the life in the concentration camps. Its horror can never be fully embraced by the imagination for the very reason that it stands outside of life and death. It can never be fully reported for the very reason that the survivor returns to the world of the living, which makes it impossible for him to believe fully in his own past experiences. It is as though he had a story to tell of another planet. For the status of the inmates in the world of the living, where nobody is supposed to know if they are alive or dead, is such that it is as though they had never been born. Therefore, all parallels create confusion and distract attention from what is essential forced labor in prisons and penal colonies, banishment, slavery, all seem for a moment to offer helpful comparisons, but on closer examination, lead nowhere." Unquote. And she goes on a bit later, speaking directly to the meaninglessness of a comparison with slavery. And I quote again, throughout history, slavery has been an institution within a social order. Slaves were not, like concentration camp inmates, withdrawn from the sight and hence the protection of their fellow men. As instruments of labor, they had a definite price and as property, a definite value. The concentration inmate has no price, 
because he can always be replaced. Nobody knows to whom he belongs because he is never seen. From the point of view of normal society, he is absolutely superfluous, although in time of acute labor shortage, as in Russia and Germany during the war, he is used for work." Unquote. The underspecification here of slavery is perhaps already an indication of its rhetorical value as a contrasting term in Arendt's motivated description. Arendt may be forgiven her evident ignorance in the early 1950s, and she's writing, as we all know, very, very close to the disclosure of the events um, in Nazi Germany and in the camps in particular. Writing in the early 1950s, when The Origins was published, of the structure and character of New World slavery <coughs> in all its regional and temporal variation. But since she loosely invokes the generality of slavery, quote, throughout history, one may legitimately ask, in what sense was New World slavery within a social order? To begin with, in what sense were colonial slave plantation societies of the sort that Arendt seems here to imagine? In what sense could the enslaved count on the protection of their fellow enslaved? And in what sense did the status of the enslaved as fungible chattel with a specifiable price and branded ownership make them invulnerable to replacement? These are not troubling details for our intent as she, as she is to establish the unparalleled character of the experience of the death camps. But they certainly have been seminal questions for the historiography of New World slavery. The fundamental fact about totalitarianism for Arendt is its historical novelty, its unprecedented originality and the death camps that constituted the organizational center of the totalitarian, of totalitarian power, aimed at transforming people into superfluous beings. Now the, e the evil of superfluousness, Arendt argues, is that it negates what is central to human dignity and human flourishing, namely spontaneity and unpredictability, the human capacity for action and by systematically stripping people of their judicial and moral and individual personhood, it renders them almost complicit in their own destruction. As you know, Eichmann in Jerusalem was Arendt's account of the trial in Israel in 1961 of Adolf Eichmann, one of the principal organizers of the deportation of Jews to the left hand. It is a very different kind of book than the originals of totalitarianism, written in a very different historical conjuncture of the Jewish question. Arendt was plainly baffled by the behavior of Altman she, wit she witnessed in the courtroom during the trial. As she said, he spoke in cliches and commonplaces about his role, emphasizing, among other things, that he was neither a hater of Jews nor a murderer but only an obedient servant of the Nazi leadership. Without diminishing the magnitude of his crime, Arendt felt obliged to agree with him that he was not the monster he was made out to be, in particular by the, by the judge in court. Eichmann was neither diabolical, nor corrupt, nor pathological. His undoubted wrongdoing was not the result of anything metaphysical, or ultimate. There was nothing profound about him, nothing radical about his deeds. What characterized him was precisely the absence of an evil intent. Indeed, he seemed precisely without autonomous or self-directed motivation, merely carrying out a function with no utilitarian purpose or part as part of a project that was in any case larger than him or anyone like him for that. Now, there are some distinguished scholars like Sheila Ben-Habitfo, for example, who feel that the concept 
banality of evil, which Arendt develops in this context, to be an unfortunate break with the earlier direction of her work and who seek to minimize its place in her contribution to moral and political theory. Others, like Richard Bernstein, by contrast, see more of a compatibility between the earlier and later ideas, indeed who see the germ of the, of the later idea already adumbrated around the same time that the earlier formulation was being advanced. I tend to think Bernstein is right, certainly more instructive, but I have no real stake in this debate. Deciding between the early and the late RN seems to me beside the point. Rather, what is notable for my purposes is that in both of Arendt's formulations, despite the evident differences, it is the association of evil with death by thoughtless killing that remains the central motif. In one instance, an idea of evil frames a characterization of the concentration camps as killing machines designed to produce death for the sake of death. In the other, an idea of evil evokes the mindless ad administration of killing, in which genocide occurred as an aspect of a thoughtless organization of systematic death, carried out by minor functionaries. The point and purpose of the organization of evil, it seems, is the perpetration of senseless death. But why should this be the only paradigm? Why should this kind of death be the only ultimate form of systematic harm? I do not know whether this is simply a conceptual question, of course, but it might be partly one. Slavery's evil. New World slavery, too, was an order of evil. But it was an order of evil quite differently organized than the Holocaust was in relation to much, including in relation to death. Huh? Ten minutes? Let's see. <laughs> the enslaved was... It is, it is uncontroversial that New World slavery was a structure of social relations of domination built on a pervasive practice of systemic violence. The enslaved were subjects whose legal and existential status exposed them to the continuous and arbitrary possibility of violent death. And yet, the singular peculiarity of New World slavery was that institutionally, as a form of relation, it depended as much or more on life as on death. Or rather, slavery depended on the production and reproduction of a certain kind of life, a perniciously constrained kind of life. In a much neglected book, Vessels of Evil, American Slavery and the Holocaust, the moral philosopher Lawrence Mordecai Thomas has sought to develop a contrast between these moral evils that draws precisely on a sense of their differences concerning life and death. And there is much to be said uh, about Thomas's book, which I won't go into. My immediate focus, however, is on Thomas's concern to think the conceptual differences between slavery and the Holocaust without lapsing, as he said, into an invidious comparison of the atrocities involved in each, without trying to determine which was worse, who suffered more and who less. Slavery and the Holocaust were both profoundly evil, Thomas says, but, their evil, but they were evil in radically different ways. Their evils, he maintains, are incommensurable, contrary to what is suggested in Arendt's remarks on the death camps referred to early, earlier, they cannot be compared on any scale of harms. Early in Vessels of Evil, Thomas puts the fundamental difference between slavery and the Holocaust in the following way, and I quote, the very telos of slavery was to bring about the utter dependence of blacks upon slave owners. The very telos of the Holocaust was the extermination of the Jewish people, unquote. A very simple formulation, so it seems. Now we may quibble about Thomas's use of the word dependence to describe the telos of, of slavery's institutional powers too mild and anemic to fully capture the nature of the structure of domination 
that secured the relation between the enslaved and the enslaver. And it may be that there is much in his overall description of this relation that raises hackers, but the point about the powers of slavery he aims to emphasize is hardly disputable. That they aimed to secure a modicum of cooperation on the part of the enslaved in their own enslavement. Thomas calls this cooperative subordination. It's a familiar story in some measure. The enslaved were obliged to internalize a relation of subordination and again, in some measure, acquiesce to it. Perhaps not surprisingly, Thomas develops his conception of the distinctive character of the evil of New World slavery, the pernicious structure of dependence, in part by drawing on Orlando Patterson's idea of natal alienation of the enslaved. And there's much, a good deal, to be, to be said uh, about Orlando Patterson, um, which I won't go into. But memorably, Patterson's aim in his book, Slavery and Social Death, is to develop a general theory of slavery as a distinctive relationship of domination. In the catastrophic picture he draws, and Thomas doesn't entirely agree with it, but still, slavery was an institution characterized by the near total power of the enslaver and the near total powerlessness of the enslaved. It involved a pervasive and all-embracing and all-embracing coercion and a continuous violence, or what amounts to the same thing, threat of violence. But this violence was of a distinctive kind, precisely because of its relation to death. Classically, as we know, slavery emerges as a substitute for violent death. The physical life of the slave is preserved, but in a distinct condition a non-death condition Patterson describes as natal alienation. What the slave suffered, he maintains, as the characteristic feature of her or his powerlessness was a, lot of, a loss of native status. The enslaved was permanently and irrevocably deracinated. Removed from all rights and claims of birth, the enslaved no longer belonged in her or his own right to any legitimate social order, any recognized community. The condition of the enslaved was that of a genealogical isolate, as Patterson calls it, a person with a past but with no heritage. That is, no right or capacity of inheritance of what is commonly shared. In short, what the slave suffered is a social death. The slave is a socially dead person. Again, there is much, but Wayne is hurrying me on. Um, and so what I want to say, in, in effect, is that what Patterson is describing as, as social death is, in effect, a form of moral evil. Irreparability. I have said that, ir that reparatory history does not presuppose reparability of all moral harm. Reparatory history need not endorse the normative demand for reconciliation. Reparatory history holds open the possibility that there are harms that cannot be repaired, that are forever. I have already invoked Hannah Arendt to sketch some of the normative features of evil talk. I return to her now to evoke a formulation of irreparability. In a perhaps well-known passage, in the all-important chapter on action in the human condition, in which Arendt is discussing the relation between forgiveness and punishment, she writes. The alternative to forgiveness, but by no means its opposite, is punishment. And both have in common that they attempt to put an end, that they attempt to put an end to something that without interference could go on endlessly. It is therefore quite significant, a structural element in the realm of human affairs, that men are unable to forgive what they cannot punish, and that they are unable to punish what has turned out to be unforgivable. This is the true hallmark of those offenses which, since Kant, we call radical evil, 
and about whose nature so little is known, even to us who have been exposed to one of their rare outbursts on the public scene. All we know is that we can neither punish nor forgive such offenses, and that they therefore transcend the realm of human affairs and the potentialities of human power." Unquote. I take it that without forgiveness, there is no repair, and therefore that by extension, what one is unable to punish is irreparable. If for different reasons, New World slavery like the Holocaust is unpunishable and consequently irreparable. Here is a description of the effects of New World slavery on the enslaved and their descendants into perpetuity, drawn from Randall Robinson's, Randall Robinson's important polemical book, The Debt, and I quote, like slavery, other human rights crimes have resulted in the loss of millions of lives, but only slavery with its sadistic patience, asphyxiated memory, and smothered cultures has hulled empty a whole race of people with, with transgenerational efficiency. Every artifact of the victim's past cultures, every custom, every ritual, every god, every language, every trace element of a people's old hereditary identity, wrenched from them and ground into a sharp, choking dust. It is a human rights crime without parallel in the modern world, for it produces its victims ad infinitum, long after the active stage of the crime has ended. Admittedly, much like Arendt, Robinson is aiming to establish an evil without parallel in this description of New World slavery. But still, there is much in the description of the, catastroph of the catastrophic effects of New World slavery here which we could ponder. I only want to note a number of its evocative and provocative features that might help us to see what it is about New World slavery that makes it not only an evil, but moreover, an irreparable one. First, as Robinson suggests, New World slavery had a totalizing, not merely isolated effect on the, on the enslaved. That is, an effect not simply on individual lives or on lives as individuals, but on the very condition of possibility of enslaved life as such. And therefore, slavery's effects was not merely on discrete areas of black human life, but on black human life as a whole. Part of the reason this is so is that New World slavery was less an event than an institutional dimension of an evolving global structure and system. New World slavery was systemic, not episodic. It wasn't there for an organization of practices added on, say, by a few evil men as a pernicious supplement to an existing but, but otherwise valid structure or system. It was not a contingent, but it was not a contingent fact of a prevailing reality. But may, that may or may not have happened this way had one actor acted otherwise. To the contrary, New World slavery was an engine with an evolving, within this evolving structure and system, or more precisely, an engine of capitalist accumulation, and therefore an engine in the making of the modern world itself. Slavery was a, constitu a constitutive fact of the making of the modern world itself. There is a lot to say here which for want of time cannot be fully elaborated, but suffice it to say that the story of the relationship between capitalist modernity and slavery is familiar enough, at least in, out in outline, thanks to Eric Williams' famous book, Capitalism and Slavery. The details of his argument may be variously disputed, but the overall arc of the connection is not in doubt. In any case, for my purposes here, the main point is less about the quantitative extent of slavery's contribution to the making of British capitalism than the fact that the institution of slavery was inside, not outside, the making of capitalist modernity. It was inside of capitalism and therefore inside Second, Robinson evokes a certain aspect of the temporality of slavery, namely its duration. New World slavery was not only systemic, that is an integral and non-contingent dimension of capitalist modernity. It also lasted 
a long time. New World slavery reproduced itself not only for a few years or even a few decades. It, prever it prevailed constitutively in its systemic role for generations on end, such that there were enslaved people who knew nothing else but the condition of their enslavement and that of their parents and of their children and grandchildren. This is an altogether elementary but absolutely crucial fact for the normalization of slavery as a hereditary social condition for black people in the Americas. But Robinson wants also to get at even, an even, at even more than this particular sense of the time span of slavery. He is pointing to slavery's racial afterlives. Slavery, he suggests, was not only a generationally reproduced institution, it was also an institution whose deep effects have long outlasted the active existence of the institution itself. Slavery is an institution that, in its per perverse construction of a racialized world, continues beyond the grave to pr produce and reproduce its evil effects. I take Robinson to be suggesting that the scale and duration of the historical crime of New World slavery is impossible either to properly imagine or rationally compute. He's right, I believe. In this context, it is far from clear what punishment would even be conceivable or what then forgiveness might look like. And consequently, it is simply beyond our human power <coughs> to formulate an intelligible notion of what repair might be established for the redress of this evil. I'm going to stop there. Thank you. thinking about what might it mean to write the story of hope. Um, and at that point, I had thought of hope as what I had defined through many people told, saying to me that we, there's nothing to be hopeful about, there's Donald Trump, there's this, whatever. I had defined hope through a certain set of looking at particular kind of activist practices to suggest that there is a kind of radical impatience with the present and that radical impatience was hope to try and sketch other futures. Now, having listened to you, and I must admit I'm a little bit uh, less hopeful, <laughs> I am now wondering, I wonder about the very possibility of the repair. And so there are a few things that I have uh, Put on the, on the agenda. You bring reconciliation. We really didn't need that with you. Yeah, we need that with you. You bring re reconciliation into a question, that possibility. Forgiveness, punishment. And in a sense, it leads me to wonder what next, what then? What next? Mm. What then? I did. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, you know, for a long time, I have been characterized as um, uh, a, a, a deep pessimist. And, uh, someone you see? <laughs> someone who produces um, work of a kind of intense hopelessness. Um, and the tragic, for example, or the catastrophic is, um, is part of the idiom of a kind of um, hopelessness or, or pessimism. <coughs> And I'm, I'm struck by that and feel that that is, in, in truth and in fact, not quite right, a characterization. Um, part of what I want to urge is perhaps a constraint perhaps a more realistic hope. A hope that embodies in it a recognition that there are that there are paths that we are going to have in a very profound, not in a superficial way, but in a profound way to live with. And that the futurities that we want ourselves to imagine and that we want our children and our children's children to imagine have to be hopes that enable them to both inherit and pass on the burden of the past. Um, and I think that there are some pasts that, to use a word you used earlier when we were in burdensomeness, and that's what I want to evoke um, by the pasts of moral wrongs, like New World Slavery, that they, that, they, that they have that peculiar feature about them, that they don't simply live on, they live on burdensomeness. They are, and there is a sense in which I think that there, there are some pasts like that. Maybe there are many pasts like that, that have that feature. And that we have, in some sense, to be able to hold the weight of them as we think futurism. So that's the first thing that I want to say about that. I mean, there's a, a, a so it, it, it's obvious, I think, that. that the, the whole preoccupation of the works, of my work, since, in part, since refashioning futures, though that may have been a little bit more hopeful for your taste, <laughs> um, but certainly since conscripts of modernity and my thinking around the tragic, is to interrupt a, a, a progressivist history, to interrupt the demand that we, from here, produce an imagination of a future to come, that we build in the presuppositions of our future to come in our attempt to think the past and the present. I want to interrupt that demand on thinking. I, it, not because I am myself not utopia. I think of myself as indeed a very utopian person. And in much of this work, it's a self-criticism. It's an attempt to interrupt my own inclination to a futurity which is, I think, foreclosed. No, and part of what I mean by that is generational. I hesitate to speak generationally, but um, I think there are enough people here of roughly my age and so on, so I'm reasonably confident. But, you know, there are some of us who, who, have, who grew up in, in worlds in which we were not simply cognitively constructed such that the future was a time that we leaned into, right? But organically, we knew the future in our bodies was a time to come. I think profoundly, fundamentally, we live in a world which in a, in a variety of different modalities of description, 
that possibility has been foreclosed. And so the very question of rethinking the possibility of futurity is, I think, harder than we, than we often take for granted. And will require a kind of rethinking of pastness, how pastnesses live, what pastnesses are, what pastnesses can yield to us, how pastnesses might need to be redescribed in order to rethink our presence. That is a labor that I think has barely I want to do two things with that. One, one, I want to go back a little bit to a question, a conversation. When you, you, you use the word speaking about the truthness of the, Holocaust, of the Holocaust in relationship to the truthness of slavery, the word slavery. And I want to go back to that um, after this, because what I want to do is, is, is put a question. But why I want to go back to that is that you said one thing which often is repeated. It was a long, long time. But another thing that is repeated is that even if it is true, it was also moral. So what does it mean that the, the other statement, but it was moral at the time? I want to talk to what that might mean when you think of moral histories. But let us open the question first before you answer that. And, you, and as I say, you can't have this wonderful conversation and there is no question. So feel burdened that you must have questions. Uh, hello, thank you so much uh, for your words and for your work. Um, I'm wondering about the, uh, speaking of looking at the past and really re-examining that and framing it for uh, reality, uh, for what we need to go forward. I'm trying to understand the use of the word Holocaust, and the, um, I'm sure you're aware uh, that there have been many discussions, and there are currently regarding the use of the word Holocaust as somewhat owned only by one uh, discussing a horrible event uh, in human history, um, and particularly with knowledge of things that have gone on in the Congo, uh, in the U.S., uh, and in many other uh, places that were colonized. So I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts on uh, on that. Should we just ask Patty to ask her question and we can read them together, is that fair? Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Yes, thank you. Talking about morals, I would like to know uh, what kind of mindset there is that uh, produces evil. What should I do? Should I respond? Oh, oh, um, could we do it first? What well, you want? It has to do with the last question. Okay. Because uh, the last Wait for the question. question yeah. The last question here brought up the question that points to the big elephant in the room that we have here. That is, and it's particularly when I listen to you um, in your constrained pessimism. My constrained what? Pessimism. Yes. Um, the history of mankind in the evolutionary sense, when we read um, evolutionary biologists, that doesn't give us a, good, a very good idea about the goodness of man. So there may be something horribly bigger, even as a backdrop against what we discuss here. There is something so inherent, 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 inherently, inherently bad and incompatible in mankind, that it bleaches almost everything that we say about badness and evil. Thank you. Um, um, I take your point about who owns the idea of a Holocaust. Um, and I, I, and you here obviously using the Holocaust in, in, in a conventional sense. And, the work which contests um, the, the Jewish ownership of it, I'm, I don't want to engage. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, that there are redescriptions in which the horrors in the Congo or other horrors are, you know, engage or make use of that term, but it is not a, a significant part of my concern. 
to, to, to wage a debate about who owns or who doesn't own it. I mean, my, my concern is to wage a, a, a debate about who owns evil. That is, that is my concern. Um, what produces the mind of evil? That's a beautiful question. Um, and and I, I, I wish I knew. But, the, but part of the point I want to make is that, that, um, that, new, that neither the, the, the attempted extermination of the Jewish people nor the, the uh, enslavement of Africans and peoples of African descent was simply produced by a mind of evil. Ma ma wickedness and reprehensible minds don't make for historical atrocities. Historical atrocities are made by much larger powers, both of commission as well as of omission. There are those who are involved in the systematic perpetration and those who stand by and allow systematic perpetration of evil things to take place, people who may not themselves be evil people. So I, I don't mind, actually, the idea, and I want to explore it myself, um, the idea of an evil mind. But, but I want to displace the problem of evil outside of the individualities of the minds that people have or don't have, to the structures in which evil actions are produced. And I take the point that, um, um, I mean, it's, a, it's such a temptation, I think, um, especially now. It is such a temptation to see evil as, in some sense, hardwired. That uh, that that there are that there are givens in our in our in our in our constitution that that lend themselves to the perpetration of um, terrible things. And any, of, you know, any of you who have kids will see children perpetrate actions that are so horrendous, mindlessly. Um, so, but I think that what's interesting here is what, um, what the moral philosopher who I talked about earlier, Lawrence Mordecai Thomas, calls the the the, the, the fragility of human goodness. And human goodness is very fragile. And, and, and he's obviously interested in what kinds of moral structures enable human goodness to prevail. And, and more than that, what kinds of human structures enable human goodness to collapse. And the, the way in which he thinks of both the, the, the extermination of the Jews and the enslavement of Africans is about the breakdown of human goodness. Now, one of the things I think is, is, is interesting, and actually what you're proposing, is that in the very proposition you make today to think about neuroslavery as evil or irreparable evil, it might be so that one could ask the question, what would, what utility or if we accept neural slavery as an irreparable evil, what utility would it do differently to name it the Holocaust? Because it is so that it is evil. There are many people who say that if you name it so, it's, it, it would be rendered more evil. But what, what you're proposing is that one doesn't need to do that. So that's one thing. There's a lovely conversation, if you can find it on the internet, between Foucault and, and um, the literary, what's his name? Okay. Chomsky. Chomsky. Yeah. Around the question of um, 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 natural, what is that? Human, human nature. A very interesting conversation. In the 19th century, battling together and just hearing Chomsky trying to think through what it might mean, and Foucault sitting back and he's saying, actually, no. He doesn't necessarily think that, and it probably is not through human nature that one should think about the question in the same way. I want to, but, I want to, but I want to disagree what, with that. Hold on, hold on, don't disagree yet. We're going to have a battle later. I want to first open to the floor. Okay. More floor. And Francie, you have to have, uh, Francie actually used to be on Eve for some long time. 
Any difference? Yes, yes. but you've given them. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, what about racial slavery as a term uh, versus new world slavery? Yeah, I was wondering whether you could um, like say more about the question of comparison in a way, at a philosophical level. And what so what it means, what are the stake of comparison of evils? Mm. Because in a way uh, yeah, well mm. <laughs> I would otherwise stop for long, so I would like to okay. if to ask you to elaborate on that. Okay. Um one more? Two. Well, let's, let's, let's hold these two and then take those. Um, so very, very quickly on the, on the Chomsky-Foucault um, exchange, <laughs> because it's, it's interesting, because it has to do with how we historicize the, the, the past and the present. And, and, and Foucault-Chomsky Foucault conversation was in a moment in which um, um, the, the kind of constructionism that Foucault was offering, offering, offering it's it's novel, novel. and it seems that it seems it seems now to be too easy um, uh, 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 to respond to the things that tend to be my language about, about um, um, the kind of the, 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 the hard wire wireness of the structure. We may not want to use that language, but but I think that it is important to think. Um, uh, that think of all the moral as not a necessary given given forever, forever, and ever, for stories, stories, and stories and, and gener generation of youth, youth, and therefore we come into the world in particular ways, and that's not easily done away with by a kind of social construction. Yeah, but I think that that's, it's, it's important to say that within the context of a museum like this. And why that is very important. Which, 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 which one? This about, about historically inscribed. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean to live generation? Because one of the interesting things that one learns when one looks at collections drawn from across the world is that the idea of a particular kind of historical inscription is also not the same everywhere. Yeah. And therefore, if we were to say human nature, we would have to think about it. As is, you're not suggesting we think human nature. But it is, for me, very important to understand that one can trace another kind of genealogy of how we understand that historical description in the Pacific, different from in Latin America, and what that might mean. But don't battle with me. Yeah. Answer those questions. Okay. Do you know Michael Jackson's song, Human Nature? <laughs> you want to sing it? No. <laughs> um, so racial slavery is a term that I use, um, and, and I'm happy to use it uh, synonymously with, with new world slavery. I, I keep using you know, new world is an, is, an old, is, a, is an old category of my own intellectual formation, and it's crucial for me to hold something about the distinctiveness of the Americas in the, in the making of new world slavery. As in the, and the making of racial slavery that is important. So the question of the racial character of enslavement and its modern character, and the, that the two are twinned in the formation of, in the, of, of capitalism, is important to my understanding and my description of, 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 of slavery. Comparison is a hard question. It's, it's the intervention that, it's, it's, it's how to produce comparison that is not invidious. It's how to produce a comparison that is not working rhetorically for your polemical purpose of establishing the priority, or the, in whichever form, the worstness, the goodness, the, the moralistic priority of your concern. How to produce a comparison that looks, um, shall I say dispassionately, at the powers involved in the construction of these two practices. What, 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 what mobilized the powers? What the powers were directed at? How powers mobilized bodies? 
what cognitive apparatus um, animated the powers without inflecting that comparison with the demand that it do the polemical work of establishing the absolute unparalleledness of what is going on. I think, so it's troubling, and I, this is not resolved in any way. It, I, I, it's something that I'm trying to think through myself. Um, because you want a comparison to work distinction, right? You want distinction to work. You want to be able to recognize that there is something different, right? And that these are not simply, it's not moral equivalence that one is after. One is after a descriptive difference that enables one to see the relevant powers in their historical specificity. I know that that's not sufficient, but it's, 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 it's a very important question. And I think Pierre's starting point, and I think many of you who are here who work in memory studies yes. and understand the work of memory studies in, 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 in thinking about certain histories, that becomes a very important question. For those of us who work with, for example, Rothbard's work on multidirectional yeah. memory and what that might mean without a certain kind of reductive comparison. Two questions here. Thank you a lot for the comments. So Dwayne a bit spoiled my question from his comment about multidirectional memory. So I actually wanted to mention this, that in uh, this discussion of either uh, this uh, slavery or Holocaust is based on the competition model of mm -hmm. memory, and that it's more productive to think of how, for example, post-colonial and discussions about politics of memory surrounding Holocaust uh, work together and not necessarily in either or competitive logic. Right. So I wouldn't necessarily want to, to ask that question about it because it was already slightly discussed, but I would say I think that this critique of the competitive model of memory politics, it's also I think that we need to critique a sort of academic culture uh, which perpetuates this sort of competitive model. And by this I mean, um, for example, taking slavery as Hannah Arendt did and uh, making it almost a straw man to which your case study is the best. And uh, mm -hmm. so I think that's also a way in which academic production or knowledge production is very cutthroat and uh, about you, know, you being the best uh, and uh, reasserting your knowledge vis-a-vis -vis others. So rather, so my thinking is yes, we should rethink theories. Let's say of memory, politics of memories, and uh, how we do how we do our comparisons. But in, at the same time, I'm wondering if that would uh, suggest a rewriting of also how knowledge production in itself is working. And, um, and my second question is, would be uh, when we talk about comparisons. Sometimes I think that. Uh, the way we do comparison is very much inherited from not just political scientists, but this desire of taking A and comparing it with B and having this dependent and independent variables and, as you say, showing that what, like they are different and showing difference. But maybe we can do different sort of comparisons, uh, like, for example, systemic comparisons or asymmetrical. So there are different like. There are authors who talk about genetic comparison. So, what are you thinking about this bigger project of rethinking the comparison as a research strategy? Right, right. Is it the second one? Okay. Um, yes, and then Francio, and then we do this. Yeah. Um, so, I wanted to uh, ask a question about conjunctures, also relating to our uh, <laughs> conversation on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so you said on, on Tuesday describing the conjuncture about sort of um, the relation of durationality um, between the here and now, um, but we're also talking today about um, the evil of slavery in its totalizingness, but also in its duration long after. Um, but I was wondering, how can we think through, or how can we think new world, new world slavery conjuncturally when it spans across so many conjunctures? And yet, it's also so definitive in shaping a conjuncture. Like, where do we put those? Mm. 
that was more than possible. Yeah. Um, three. Three more or no. after? Answer, answer, let's do two at that time. Or you want to just give it to you, Keith, and, and, and then do those two. Gosh, I feel like I'm on the spot. Um, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I'm still trying to figure out what to ask. But uh, early this year, I was in Gori Island um, in uh, Senegal. Um, and I was in Gori Island, and I was there at the point of no return. And then I looked at the ocean, and I come from Samoa, the liquid continent, with the Pacific. And then I looked out into the ocean and thought about the slaves that were forced into the ship and dispatched or kidnapped into other parts of the world. And then so I think about my island that's sinking, well, that is um, experiencing a sea level rise of four millimeters uh, and rising every year. And thought about how the consequence of slavery impacts not only people of Africa and African descent, but it also impacts um, uh, other oceans outside of the Atlantic, places like the Pacific. And I was wondering whether if you're able to, because I know that what you're thinking right now is still preliminary and stuff, but I was wondering whether if you're able to elaborate a little bit on the impact that it has, like, outside of communities that perhaps may have not gone through history of slavery or the Holocaust. Um, so, so it, um, I, 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 I like the idea that the, I think that there is something crucial in your point about academic production and the way comparison often works itself, since very often institutions, not just academic institutions, but dare I say institutions like this, have their structural imperatives of one sort or another, and that one produces work willy-nilly sometimes, willfully sometimes, um, as a way of reproducing those structures, those institutional powers, and so forth. And one wants to hope that there is critical work that inside of those institutions that works against that. Having said that, um, the, you know, at, at least as I hear it, part of the point, um, part of the, dif the difficulty of comparison is that comparisons are never, never take place in abstractions, they are linked themselves to powers. Yeah. So that there are formidable powers through which the Holocaust is constructed as a, a truth game, as a meta-truth, right? And it is not, not simply where the world slavery is concerned, but 99.9% you know, .9 of work on trauma takes the Holocaust as the imago, so to speak, of thinking through. And it's very, and that has to do with the powers through which scholarly paradigms or intellectual paradigms get constructed as such. And I think that in confronting and trying to do comparison work from the margins, so to speak, one has to find a way to think through how one both makes use of and sets at a distance the paradigm that is already hegemonic. And that's not, I think, simple. Because you don't, you don't want to, to, to both, uh, you have to think carefully about how you, about how you borrow and not borrow. And, and I say that this advisedly because, you know, in the immediate aftermath of the, of, of the, of the, of the Second World War and uh, the uh, revelations of what went, went on in the concentration and death camps, and in particular in the work of uh, people writing memoirs uh, of their experiences in the camps, and, and very particularly in the work of Bruno Bettelheim. Um, that, work, that work became very crucial for a certain set of interventions in the historiography of New World slavery. 
In that moment, there emerged a question in New World Slavery around what the slave personality was, right? And that work was, was, was his, historiographically, that work was historiographically connected to the attempt to think about the personality that emerged inside the concentration camp. Right? Stanley Elkins is the American historian who did this work. And that work came to be very crucial in, in, in the study of Caribbean slavery. Orlando Patterson's work that I noted earlier, and his very idea of, the, of plantation slavery as a totalizing structure is partly drawn from the way in which people like Irving Goffman in the 1950s is thinking about the structure of the concentration camps. So there are profound ways in which these are intersecting historiographies and how to, how to, how to hold a productive relationship and not an invidious relationship between the two is I think a labor of critical writing, which is what obviously we are trying to engage in. Um, question of the conjuncture again and, and overlapping conjunctures. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a very, very good question. I don't quite know how to answer beyond my own banalities, which is that yes, these are, it, uh, because we are talking here about um, we're talking here about historical, the, a contrast perhaps, uh, I'm making this up as I go along, I'm so, <laughs> <laughs> a contrast between historical conjunctures and memorial conjunctures. That is conjunctures of the past and conjunctures of the present, which is, which is what's really tough, right? How, what is it, how do we re-describe a, a past, a past conjuncture, in ways that enable us in our conjuncture to think productively, generatively? And that demands practices of description and of redescription, both redescriptions of the multiplicity of conjunctures that converged in the description of what we call the history of New World slavery. And the, multiplicity, the, the multiple and overlapping conjunctures that converge on what we call the racial present, which are multiple, overlapping, right? Racial presence in, in, in the Netherlands are not quite the same as racial presence in Suriname or in New York or wherever else. So these are, but, they are, they are, but there is a motivation to think that they are nevertheless de de definable as racial presence. How does racial presence as an, over, as a, as an overarching description hold inside itself different kinds of spatialities and temporalities that make it nevertheless useful to name it that way? Because there will be debates in which undoubtedly people will say, but that racial present is not my racial present. And then we get into a very interesting, potentially interesting debate about whether or not racial present, maybe it's an ethnic present, Maybe it's a religious present that has racial inflections, but is not adequately named in that particular way. And I think, and I think the, the contestation around description, therefore, both of the past and the present, is enormously crucial to how we think about, about the present. But which, 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 which makes, you know, I was thinking about your question, um, this, about, about four or five o'clock this morning, the question you asked me on Tuesday about Earth Block. Which is, the, which is the, the wonderful thing about occasions like this, I think. No, you, can you repeat the question? The question, so the question was about the relationship between Ernst Bloch's conception of an imminent now and Stuart Hall's idea of a conjuncture. And one of the things I think about Stuart Hall's conception of a conjuncture, unlike, I think, Ernst Bloch's, is that it was unrelentingly political. Stuart wanted always to describe a now which potentially opened to a tomorrow. It, so his, his preoccupation was not a, a philosophic, as in many ways I think Ernst Bloch's is. It's a, it's, it, has a, it has a depth of philosophic preoccupation that Stuart Hall wanted to strip away 
in order to ask himself and us the question, what can we do politically in this conjuncture? What can we do now that is different from what we did yesterday in order to create the possibility of an alternative tomorrow? Ah, you keep that question is impossible. Um, the impacts are multiple. Um, um, and it's partly the result, the unresolvedness of generations who are not themselves um, you know there is a there is a remark I think it's I think it's um, Borges's remark that <coughs> Richard Price uses in a book which some many of you must be familiar with his book First Time and he has a he uses as an epigraph the, a, a remark there came a day in time when the last eyes to see Christ closed forever and Christ became a problem about memory. Right? And, and part of what he wants to do with, in, with that is to, he's talking about the Saramaka, that there came a day in time when the last enslaved person to see an African off the ship closed forever. And Africa became, and the Middle Passage became a problem about memory. And part of the work here, obviously, is the way in which the, the inheritance of the past of atrocity means the present. How we think moral, psychologically and materially about what that impact is, I think, is the kind of work that is going on with me in this museum and, and others who are seeking to describe what those pasts meant for this present. Um. There's Shruti, uh, uh, Martin, and Francie. And then after that, Chip. <laughs> and then after that, Chip. Oh. Oh. No, no, no. So thank you very much for your uh, very, very inspiring, interesting talk. Um, I, I want to, uh, I want to give, I want to agree with you that we need a certain hesitation towards a progressivist history, if that means you know, um, a, a kind of history which will think of the past having been dealt with and completed, and therefore um, we can carry on. Um, so I, I do agree with you that uh, we need to retain some kind of burdensomeness. But at the same time, I feel by um, using the idea of the irreparable evil, you're, mm -hmm. or are you sidelining the question of reparation? So mm -hmm. what's the relation between repair and reparation? And reparation can take many forms. It can take the form of money, like demands for repayment, mm -hmm. of, of, uh, or it can take the form of apologies, public apologies. It can take the form of institutional acts, the things that, like uh, Wayne was mentioning about what a museum should do and so on. But um, if one doesn't deal with reparation, then isn't that also a kind of silencing the past to right. stick with true you? Um, so that's one thing for me, like how do you relate reparation? That's really practical things <laughs> to re irreparability. Right? Right. Keep an irreparable sense of ir reparation. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is, the second point I wanted to ask is like, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, perhaps it's a stupid question, but um, why only new world slavery as irreparable evil? Uh, so, because, mm, so could one say, for example, that, and now with the whole comparison question, patriarchy as irreparable labor, evil? Because uh, in the old world slavery, right, if that's what the, the, the distinction is about, uh, women were also slaves also a form of property. And um, so, but to me, I would be very impatient with that notion uh, from a feminist perspective to understand patriarchy as irreparable evil um, won't do from a moral perspective, from the perspective of um, yeah, justice, transformation, and so on. Uh, so that also makes me a bit uncomfortable with your use of evil. Why evil? Why not injustice? Which then has some scope. 
Whereas evil, we can sit with it and be like think of from religion and moral and psychological and all kinds of points of view. But mm -hmm. I don't know. Thank you. I'm on the wrong. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for a very thought-provoking talk. And it always takes me, I always say this, but it always takes me days to process things like this, so my structure doesn't come out right. But. So I have two things. One, this is exactly what you were saying, is if, if this idea of irreparable, irreparable evil can also backfire in a way, in a sense that it can create a condition in which people say, um, those in power say, well, if it's irreparable, then we don't have to do anything. There's a sense of complacency that is sort of maybe inherent in that. Um, and I was wondering, getting to the question that Wayne was mentioning, this idea of it was legal at the time or it was moral at the time, um, whether this new zeitgeist of, um, of human rights discourse, problematic as it may be for its entanglement with neoliberalism, actually gives us a scope of action saying, well, if human rights are indeed universal, then it would, there is never a thing as it was legal at, at the time um, because these people were human beings and actually yeah, creates a scope of action for reparations. Um, and the other thing I was wondering, as a curator, what do you think the role of ethnographic museums is in this? Is it really to be the burden? Because if it's irreparable, is it, is it our role as a museum and as a public that's space? All, that's a question, that's how I earn my dinner. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in a museum. Oh, well, there we go. So that's the dinner question, not the million really dollar question, but the like 40 year question. Um, what, what, what is it that we do here? Is it, is it really that? Is it reminding people um, constantly reminding people and constantly being this burden, and I'm, I'd be happy with that role. Um, or is there a way that we can change that to also, if you're really not a pessimist, what's the positive, <laughs> <laughs> the ultimate scope in that? What, what can we present in this museum, burdening people on the one hand, but also having a sort of transformative agent? Should I respond to this? Yeah. Can I take those two and then we have two? two. Um, the moment you mentioned Borges, I became a bigger fan of Borges. Because <laughs> I like Borges a lot, and that's, that's the only book I read continuously, or his, his, his fiction. Um, there's a set of things that, that I find interesting in what you did, and I want to try and provoke you to, to go further. One of them is, I used to think about evil in the past, and I came to the, to, the, um, to the conclusion, if you wish, that New World slavery was never about evil. It was actually about the good. If you actually tie it to evil, then you are into that conversation of how you compare it to the Holocaust and so forth and Arendt. But if you tie it to good, and the good is of Caesar, then the good is about counting, accountability, about no, having no mess, about organization. So slavery to me was never actually a regime of evil. It was a regime about the good. And if you then try to think about evil, then evil is that which is trying to unravel certain politics of the good. Now what that would mean to me, and, and I'm asking you to, to think about this, what that would mean to me is that evil is related to debt, but it's related to symbolic debt. And symbolic debt is not the same as social debt. Symbolic debt is what is trying to undo social debt. And much of the popular culture of the New World has been about symbolic debt, about actually trying to undo um, uh, social debt. And that brings up the question of time, actually. Um, and to me, it is a question of, have we lost time? Have we lost? Have we lost time? And, and, and the search for time. So I would tie time to debt and to hope. And I think it is a mistake to ever count hope, to ever put hope as something that is countable. Um, the question of counting is perhaps one of the problems. And counting, accountability, Kant and his radical evil, forgiveness and so forth, these are all um, theories of the good. So if you could turn it around, Someone like Baudrillard would say, it's always been about the good. We have to learn to think about evil in a different way. Otherwise, we remain in the theological. Um, so if you could um, try to talk to this. Let's put it this way. Um, it's 
switching views. Thanks very much for that. Um, so I didn't read the last part of the paper, which, which, which partly responds to what you're getting at. Um, the irreparability of evil for me doesn't preclude reparatory politics, a politics of um, making demands in the present. Um, and in fact, the kind, I mean, I have a particular response to, um, I mean, for, 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 uh, and have written about this one and, 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 won't, and won't try to reproduce it here. But part of what I want to say is that, in fact, the, that the fact of irreparability itself ought to drive the demand for rep reparation. How, how and whether one thinks of reparation in terms of material or symbolic goods is another and very complicated matter. But I want to, I, I want to, 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 to endorse, if you like, a reparative politics that recognizes that there is a debt here a debt here that cannot be overcome. That, that, that doesn't come to an end by the putting up of a monument or a hundred million dollars. That, that, that there is a wrong that has been committed that will live forever. However much the demand to provide schools for black children or scholarships for black students of forms of ameliorative action are enormously politically important in the present. So, so by no means. What I want a reparative politics to preclude, however, is the, is, the, is the postponement of the idea that the past can be repaired. And a reconciliatory approach to reparative, to reparatory, to, to injustice is often, is often the mobilization of the demand that black people ought to wait longer, wait for a coming future, a future when race relations will be repaired. I want to, I want to argue in a way that forecloses that possibility, that the demand for reparation is a now, not for a future, but to repair the past. And there's a very interesting um, distinction, I think, the distinction between compensation and reparation. A very, very interesting distinction in, in forms of legal and moral philosophy. And that compensation is compensation for acts of God that remove a human being, for example, from the ability to participate in the workforce. And that what compensation does, like insurance, is to enable, is to enable futurity. Right? What compensation does is to enable the person to return to the workforce to reproduce themselves and their society for a coming future. That's compensation. What reparation is different? Reparation doesn't presuppose a futurity. It is not the future that is here the problem. It is the past. And that what reparation seeks to do is to, is to make amends for that past, not with the, with the hope that a future will be better. And that's important because a good deal of reconciliatory justice work is to say that yes, reconciliation for <coughs> all things being equal. That is to say that, that reparative demands depend on circumstances in which there are competing claims on the state's ability to make repair for the past and the present. And that is a, that there's a large literature around reparative justice that, that wends its way through this way and that way. The most interesting of them is a, is a philosopher in, in, in Australia named Janet Thompson. Fascinating work on, on, on um, think, trying to think through aspects of this problem. So to answer your question, no, I am driven by a demand for reparation now with the recognition that that reparation is an attempt to make good on a debt that is itself unpayable. And I want to say one has to work with that, that, that conception. Uh, the the patriarchal question is, 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 is a 
slightly crucial. I, I mean, I, I think, I mean, obviously, New World Slavery was a patriarchal structure itself in, in fundamental ways, as we know. Um, and how, how one, how one, how one, how one names structures of domination evil and, and not others is, that's a, that's a large part of what I am still trying to work my way through. So I, 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 feel, I feel like I can't respond to that, um, to, that, to that part of your question. The question of evil, though, as opposed to injustice, is, is, also, is also important and one that I don't think I have a fully worked out response. I want to, I, I want to, to try and put my finger on certain kinds of historical pasts that weigh in distinctive ways on the present. That weigh in, this is why the word burdensome is interesting to me, because I don't want, I want to use burdensome in a technical way. I think that it is something that, that is an, an unresolvedness of a particular historical past, a structure in the past that in some sense has come to an end. But what it produced inside that historical structure has not come to an end. That lives on. Patriarchy lives on. It, it, it's, a, it's part of the structure of our everyday lives in our neoliberal capitalist present, right? So I mean, it's, it's, it, it is very much part of the present in which we live and work. Whereas the past of New World slavery and such, and such like um, historical orders are orders that in some formal way have been brought to an end. But their effects continue in the present. And it is that distinction that is crucial to what I want to talk about. Um, um, it, uh, yes. So, so, so part of my response is the response to Sruti, I think. Um, um, I am not sure, I mean, I think the problem about moral at the time is complicated. Um, and how, how one, whether one, because one can re-describe really the story of at the very least, 18th century Europe, and certainly large parts of, 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 uh, of what's sometimes called Western Europe, in which, in which there, there are emerging um, discourses in, that recognize fully that, that slavery is morally wrong, that the, that the, that the enslavement of people um, in the New World is morally wrong, which is, which is partly why there were very few enslaved peoples in Europe. That slavery was something that happened in a moral elsewhere. And so, and, and, and that's a, the, whether, and whether or not at what extent slavery was legal or illegal is itself a very um, a, a, a complicated debate. It is absolutely the case that modern states, certainly the states in, in France and the states in Britain, um, um, ratified codes, whether the Code Noir in France or the various legislative orders that were ratified by the colonial state in, uh, from, coming from the, 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 the assemblies in, in, in the Caribbean that were, that were legal orders. So in that sense, slavery was legal. But you know, this was of course, as you well know, a debate in Nuremberg. About, about the Nazi regime and whether and how were the perpetrators of the evil of the extermination of the Jews to be tried? In what legal regime were, they, were, were their actions to be understood? One could argue that those were laws, but evil laws. So I think that's a, that's a huge and very important debate about how one establishes uh, what moral order is it in relation to which one is calling something evil or not? And I think that partly hinges on what I invoked earlier as the rise of a kind of humanitarianism. Because I think part of the backdrop to what I'm saying here is, a, is, the, is, is the return of what I think of as an, of new forms of universality. We want to think 
of claims that are claims about humanity. And one wants to be able to invoke that in a richly critical but capacious way. These are questions about what were crimes, if you like, against humanity, which have no statute of limitation. Um, oh, the museum, what was, you know, I think what you guys are doing is amazing. So, <laughs> You're just arguing. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I think, I think the, re, 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 the, the critical re-memorialization re, re of, of those pasts is crucial. I don't have any prescription about what kinds of, um, you know, what, what kinds of curatorial work as opposed to not or other kinds of curatorial work is important because in some sense one doesn't know what is feeling one's way in relation to the kinds of representations or re-representations that produce what kinds of effects in um, re effects of rethinking in those who are viewing these or talking about these exhibitions. And I think that is simply an, an endlessly ongoing work. I don't think there will be ever an exhibition or a text or a presentation that will forever displace or transform the way in which we think that past in the present. How am I to respond to this question? Um, I, 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 I'm not sure. I mean, there's probably a lot that you have to do to help me to understand the, the contrast there that, that, that slavery was an attempt, that, that the structure of slavery, and here I, I, I don't want to talk about ancient slavery, um, but the structure of slavery in the Americas was a structure that has to be understood in relation to the good, the good for whom. Amazing sir, who spoke yesterday, and he was asked about slavery, you were slavery, who says, let's not call it evil. It was something good at that time. Let's think about the good. Oh, I see that's what you mean. Um, I see what you mean. It, yes, OK. It, 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 there, there, there was a moral order in which um, people understood it to be are good. I might have to debate Amy's what, what it is Amy says there, what the implications of that argument were and what you know what where he where he understood that argument to be going. So I would want to know where and on what kind of occasion he said so. It's tied into the question of um, interests. Right? And that 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 Hannah Arendt might have echoed Amy says there and said, well, yes, it was, it was part of a structure of, of interests, and that it, 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 it served certain interests and was therefore understood as a progressive part. David Brian Davis has written about it in, 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 in a book called human, uh, Slavery and Human Progress. Um, at the moment at which it is, not, it, is, it is perceived no longer to be serving human interests. Um, I, I want to wonder whether we should be obliged to take that as, um, or how we take that. What, what kind of, into what kind of argument we insert the notion that slavery was a good and how to think of that. So I'm, I don't know, I mean I'm thinking of low about with your proposition here. It was, a, it, it, was a, it, it was presumed to be a good for those who held slaves. The question of lost time, death, and hope again goes back to questions that have circulated in, in other ways, and it is a it is a preoccupation of mine how to think about about loss. It's connected to how I think about generations. It is connected to to the question of how and whether one builds a notion of futurity. I completely agree with you that hope is uncountable. Uh, and I, 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 I agree with you that there, there is a problem about moral discussion that renders itself, and, and slavery seems to curiously and 
in some sense, perversely to be inserted into a discourse about Kantian very often. But it seems to me that what is distinctive about New York slavery, and it speaks to something that was raised earlier, uh, to the question of reparations, that what's interesting about, about New York slavery is that the evil is uncountable. Slavery is not simply about what, what about stolen labor. Slavery is not about the goods that were taken from the enslaved. Although there are, as some of you may know, there are accountants involved in various reparation politics that are, that are seeking to count hours of labor and how that might be repaid, etc. I think that's enormously important, reparation politics. And what's interesting about that is that the sums of money in contemporary terms that would have to be paid to the descendants of peoples of African descent is itself unimaginable. What would be owed for the labor of the, uh, of the enslaved for the three or four hundred years of enslavement is an, is an incalculable amount. But what is more important for me than the question of countability is that New World slavery was not simply um, a, about what happened in the discrete acts of enslavement on the slave plantations. New World slavery was part of the making of the world in which we live. It is impossible to walk in Amsterdam or London or Paris or New York and not recognize around us a world that was built, as C.L.R. James once put it, on the back of half a million slaves. When James is talking about Paris, that you walk through Paris, it was built on the labor of half a million slaves. It is impossible to make a repayment for what was built with what was taken from those slaves. Can I? <laughs> the last one. Yeah, can yes? you say something? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, about goodness. I don't think that there is any goodness in, uh, in the uh, history of slavery. For one thing, the abolitionists uh, who wanted uh, to end slavery, uh, most of them were racist themselves. Uh, secondly, uh, most of them wanted to redeem themselves also because of they, wa they didn't want anything to do with the evil anymore. They knew that it was corrupting uh, their minds, so it was not goodness but uh, self-interest. And thirdly, I want to say uh, that it took this so-called goodness more than 300 years to end itself only partly because the, the effects, racism, still go on. So I don't see any goodness in this uh, narrative. Thank you. Well, but maybe you know, I didn't I mean, understand yes, no, what you said. But I think what, what, what we, we um, let us, no, I don't know even if I can close, or do you close, but first of all, there is something in a little way which goes back to what Shruti said, which I think um, you have described um, around the question of what is the burden that burdens and myths that we feel um, for a particular past. And, and, and I think that there is a lot of work, actually interesting work, um, no, in with relationship to memory studies, so my, Michael Rothberg is having a new book that's coming out shortly on called the implicated subject and what that might mean. Um, but there is also a book um, that thinks about the question of beneficence and what does it mean all of us to be beneficiaries to a particular kind of past, and what is the urgency of that beneficence to try, even though we know we're going to fail or we don't know that we can do it to try to inaugurate other possible futures. In that beneficence comes actually Yuki's answer. Because what he tries to do as well, and he, he's, he's actually reading, okay, his name is Robbins, I think. He's actually reading something, um, 1984, oh well. And he's reading one of, not, not 1984, another one. Um, to think through how we are not only burdened, all of us, 
with doing something, but burdened in the sense also of what is happening to the precarity of those suffering the most from climate change. And how we are all conscripted in that, also in the questions of an ongoing patriarchal society. So beneficence provides a possibility of thinking of burdensomeness. And there is no past end to this. But what I think is fruitful in our conversation, and I think this has been a wonderful conversation, is for us to understand perhaps irreparability as something that invites us, that forces us, that makes us, and many people don't like this word, feel guilty in a certain sense, to try and structure another kind of present and future, even if it is one without hope. <laughs> So, <laughs> but it is our work, it is our work, it is our work. And perhaps, Marty, it is just what you're stuck with as a kid. It is your work. I want you all to help me thank David Sam. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all for having me. Sheila, I'm sorry I didn't give you a question, but if you, if we can do it here. Is that all right? Um, for those of you who might want to come back tomorrow, we have another conversation, um, Refusal and Radical Hope, with Saidi Hart and Tina Kant and Alexander Wehe. So you're welcome to come back. As in this, in, well, we moved it to another room, but you just come, it's, it's here in the museum, um, in the, the Trouble Theatre. And let us continue the conversation, because that is part of how we might move towards thinking, repair. Thank you. Oh, really?